Good morning, everybody. Great resonance, yeah. So, um, what did we do on the first part, two lectures? So, I told you a lot about the physics of these topological insulator systems. Well, I told, gave you a first impression, I think. And then I took uh, the main part, I mean, I told you about this SSH model, which hopefully got you a little bit of the idea how uh, we can do mathematics about these systems. And then I gave you a lengthy lecture about K-theory yesterday. And today I want to show you how you apply this K-theory in uh, these uh, solid state physics systems, okay? So one thing that I did forget to tell you is that I told you a lot about K-theory, but I didn't tell you one story about K-theory. Namely, we did not use any real structures yet. So in the physical systems, uh, where you have time reversal symmetry or where you have a particle hole symmetry, uh, these sy symmetries of the systems, they're typically um, implemented by uh, real structures. And then you are naturally led to look at, for example, on projections, Fermi projections in the physical systems, which are real, okay? And then you don't want to do homotopies in the class of all kinds of projections, but only in the class of projections which are real, okay? So like in real matrices, for example, real projector, Ma projection matrices. And uh, well, then you have to do a new theory of uh, K-theory which conserves real structures and this field is called K-R theory. K for well, K-theory and R for real. And um, there's basically no literature, uh, modern literature on that. There are old-fashioned books on that and uh, it's a bit of an annoying story that uh, up to now nobody has sat down to write out the things in detail. So we've been doing that, but uh, there's no good account of that yet. So therefore I don't lecture on that uh, either here, okay? So we'll stick to the classes of uh, systems where you don't have these symmetries for, for today. So how were these solid state systems uh, modeled? Um, well, I gave you uh, example of a one-dimensional system and it looked very similar to this type of a Hamiltonian here. You have a kinetic operator, you may think of a Laplacian, and you have a potential operator. So there are a few details to this now. The first thing is that, okay, I mean we, Laplacian here is always a discrete Laplacian, so we work on a d-dimensional lattice. The second thing is that the Laplacian may, may have a magnetic field, which is very important to model a number of effects. So uh, the Laplacian doesn't only involve the uh, translations, but it involves the magnetic translations, which in two dimensions I wrote out for you when I described the Harper model. Yeah? But in higher dimensions, well, you go on. In higher in three dimensions, you have three magnetic field directions. They define a anti-symmetric real tensor from which you can construct a magnetic, uh, magnetic Laplace operators, okay? Or magnetic shift operators. Basically what we did is we started with, here's a shift, magnetic shift operator. The first one was just the usual shift. The second one, well, you had in the Landau gauge a phase factor, which was given by a position operator and the magnetic field and the one, two directions. And then you go on and when you add the third direction, you have a magnetic field and the one, two, in the one, three, and, and the three, two direction, okay? And you have to think how do you implement, implement that? The right way, or one way to implement it is that, well, you, you add these supplementary phase factors and you see how you would go on, okay? For higher dimensions. So using these shift operators, you build the magnetic translation. The magnetic translations look like this and they is something else in this thing where these T's here, they are, uh, they were just numbers one in the Laplace operator that we had, the magnetic Laplace operator on the lattice, which was the Harper operator. Now they can be more complicated, and this is in extremely important that they can be more complicated. They can be matrices, okay? So there's a matrix degree of freedom in the Hilbert space where you can put the spins, the particle hole degrees of freedom, a bipartite structure of the lattice, anything which you will find of interest in your physical system and you want to model, you put into these internal degrees of freedom over every side, okay? And therefore also the kinetic operator has here matrices 
and for simplicity here, I choose them to be non-random and you know the same uh, on every side. Um, which model, for example, is spin-orbit coupling. And these spin-orbit coupling are important for, for physical effects. Maybe I can give you an example later on, okay? Or you, I can tell you more if you ask me at least. So this describes this kinetic operator. And then there is uh, the potential. Well, the potential now, of course, is also a matrix-valued potential because the Hilbert space on every side has a matrix degree of freedom. And, uh, well, typical way of having a potential is the formula down here. Well, it should be self-adjoint. It should be diagonal, therefore potential. But in the middle, there's an omega n. And this omega n is not just a number. It's a matrix, a self-adjoint matrix of square matrix of the size of the uh, dimension of the fiber space that you have. Okay? So these are the generic models that we look at. And let me assert that this really covers in the one particle framework, it covers everything that you can do in solid state physics. So there's no an, an analog of the magnetic potential in this case? Well, the magnetic potential, I mean. Um, you have only the circulation. Yes, I only have a constant magnetic field here, okay, to make things simple, but also because that's what one is most interested in, I would say, yeah. And. Uh, it only enters here in, in, the, in the kinetic part. If you allow B to depend on N on the side of the magnetic, you could do that, OK? But the next thing which I'm going to tell you is not going to be true, because what I do want is I want to have homogeneous systems, which are the same in space in some sense, so that the solid, of course, even if it's a random solid, yeah, it looks at some point it has a certain random configuration. You will never find that configuration. But in some sense, if you move to another place in physical space, the, the configuration will not be the same anymore, but then somehow it should be similar. Okay? So what one usually does is that one says, I have a random model for that, or I have a, a model for my, my Hamiltonian, so for my solid which looks roughly the same on one space as on the other side. And if I just look at the neighborhood of another side, just means that I shift the configuration of the solid. Okay, So this is what people call uh, covariant families of Hamiltonian. And um, well, for that, in order to describe it, usually standard notation is to, to use a space omega, which is a compact space, where you put all the disorder in that you have. In this concrete formulation, it's just these matrices, you could either choose them, as I said, randomly, independent, identically chosen, independent in the site N, okay, and uh, random in the set of square matrices, okay, that would be a canonical model. Another way what, uh, that one can proceed, one could say, well, I want to study quasi crystals, then I choose them according to some dynamical system which is behind it, which acts on omega, okay? And Lana probably will talk something about that. Anyway, so we have the space of configurations. The configuration is really the configuration of the solid, and I can shift this configuration. That's the shift action T by the translation group ZD on the lattice here, which acts on omega. And it just shifts the configuration, okay? So what makes the family of Hamiltonian here? It depends on this index omega, which is the configuration. What does it make it a covariant family? Well, if you shift the Hamiltonian by a translation on the lattice, which is called V here, it gives you the new, another uh, Hamiltonian out of the family, which is just shifted by the same size that you shifted here, the operator. So why is here V? If there would be no magnetic field, this would be just the usual shift, the usual shift operators by A that you have. But with a magnetic field, you have a certain problem because the magnetic translations that we had here, you know, they are not they're not invariant by translations because there are these x's in there. However, you know, or one knows, and I, I don't give you the detailed formula, that there's something called the dual magnetic translations, which have the, which, which leave these translations, the magnetic translations themselves, invariant. Okay? So, therefore, you use these dual magnetic translations, they have this property, okay? They commute with the other magnetic translations. And you, it's a bit tedious to write out the formulas for that, but believe me, it's, it's possible, okay? You can do that. And if you don't feel comfortable, just think of 
the, sh the SJBs with uh, B as being the, the, the ones without magnetic field, and then the Vs are also just the usual shifts without magnetic field, okay? That's the easiest case, which of course is also covered. Now, what one usually does is I don't want to look at it too big, too big of an algebra of operators, because if well, one of the things that we did see is that if I look at all operators on the Hilbert space, the K theorem, uh, I, I told you this was Kuiper's theorem, for example, for K, K1, which tells you there's nothing interesting to see. And the topology, where does it come from? It comes from by, look, by looking at a smaller algebra, and the smaller algebra is somehow close to what the periodic operators are. And this is the covariant operators. And what we do is we build an algebra out of all operators which satisfy this relation here. You look at the all families of operators which are covariant, which satisfy this, and are short range. Okay? Short range meaning that you don't have the particle cannot move from one side to infinitely far away. Well, it can move very far, but the probability to do that is extremely small, okay? So, um, if you do that, and you, take a C, you build a C star algebra out of that, you get what people call a twisted cross product, okay? For those who don't know, don't worry about it, but it's a standard object in the, algebra, in, in the field of C star algebras, which leads to many interesting examples, okay? Uh, but you can just think of the observable algebra in dimension D as, well, the C-star algebra that you build out of all covariant families of operators. So, um, maybe before going on, of course, one can consider systems which have, first of all, no magnetic field and which have no disorder at all. So the omega is reduced to one single point, and if the systems are completely periodic, then omega is one point, and there's only one operator which, which is periodic, and then you can still do this construction. And if you do that, the C star algebra that you will get is by via bloch floquet transform, is just the algebra of continuous functions on the d-dimensional torus. Okay? So this larger thing here generalizes the uh, algebra on the d-dimensional torus and in our applications allows us to go from periodic operator to random operators. Nevertheless, it contains a lot of spatial structure of the d-dimensional uh, lattice, yeah? So that I can extract the same type of topology that there is on the d-dimensional torus, okay? And this is the topology which is really interesting and relevant that we want to analyze and calculate, okay? So now we learned about K-theory, so how about this thing? This is a C-star algebra. How do you calculate this K-theory? And what is the K-theory? This is what I tell you on the next slide. The first thing which makes simple things simpler, and I'm going to do this assumption, is when omega is contractible. So if all the random matrices, they are taking from a nicely uh, how do you say, simply connected uh, region of matrices, nice and compact, and then you can just contract them to them one point. Okay, that means contraction in the sense of topology. If you can do that for every side, well, you can contract all points in omega to one single point, which is the point without disorder. Okay, that means that omega is contractible. That's something that you cannot do if you have a quasi-periodic system, for example. Then there configurations on different sides, they're heavily linked to each other. But here, for random systems, this is perfectly okay. And now there's one important fact in K-theory that if you have uh, a contraction of, um, of the algebra, which one calls a, a, a deformation, a deformational retract of a given algebra, you deform homotopically the algebra to something maybe much simpler in this case, yeah? the K-theory doesn't change, which is completely natural because the K-theory is a topological theory. So if you do topologically deformations to something simpler, you should get the same K-theory groups, okay? 
And therefore, we can restrict to calculating the K-theory of uh, a much simpler algebra, namely basically the algebra which is just generated by these magnetic shift operators. I can't deform them away, okay? But the disorder, I can move it to zero. That's basically the message. Okay, so this C star algebra generated by D operators which have commutation relations which are like in the Harper operator, the two magnetic translations. No, I just have D magnetic translations and they all commute up to phases. This algebra is very well studied. It's called the rotation algebra in dimension D. And the only data that you have to fix it are the magnetic fields in the different directions. Okay, it's one anti-symmetric real matrix which is, gives you that of, of size D. And uh, these K the, the K theory of that has been calculated in a very famous and influential paper in, from 1980 by Pimsma and Voiculescu, two Romanian mathematicians. And they say that K0, so you remember the equivalence classes of projections in that algebra here, is z to the power 2 to the power uh, d minus 1. So in dimension d equal to 2, you have here um, a z. Okay? And over there, k1 is the same z. Okay? So let's try and understand a little bit where these things come from and uh, what we can do with them. D equal to 2, sorry, it's Z2, huh? I should have said, right, it's Z2, because it's... So, how did these guys go about uh, proving this? What they proved is that the six-term exact sequence that I was explaining in detail yesterday actually splits in two exact sequences, namely, you have two short exact sequences, but these are not the lines which were standing on top, in the top line and the bottom line, what you see there's K0, K0, and here's a K1, okay? So these are like triangles in this exact sequence that we had, one triangle here and one triangle there. Uh, so they do involve the two non-trivial maps, the exponential index map, and well, what are the algebras in there? That's also remarkable. There's the d-dimensional algebra, but it allows you to reduce the calculation of the d-dimensional algebra in terms of the ones which are of dimension d minus one. So you get an inductive procedure over dimension which allows you to calculate the K theory, okay? Why? Because if you have here such an exact sequence of three groups, it basically means that the group in the middle is the direct sum of the group on the right and on the left, okay? It's a direct sum. And the other formula is the same. So, of course, the fact that these connecting maps which were here, so this was the I star, that this I star in this particular example of the rotation algebra, that that is trivial, is, is a really deep fact, okay? You really have to do something to prove that. It's not an easy result, this uh, thing here. Uh, this is also I star, yeah. So these two maps, they are zero in this particular case of the rotation algebra. Okay. In any case, you see, you now start out with the case D equal to um, one, where we already calculated the K theory, which is just D equal to one is just one shift operator. One shift operator was just the C star algebra of the torus, and we knew on the torus, K1 on the torus was Z, which was generated by the rotation number, and K0 of the torus was also Z, which was just generated by the dimension of the fibers that you had on top, okay? Once you know that, well, you go in, uh, you calculate K0 of A2, okay? Well, it's given by the sum of these two, which are both Z, so you get a Z2 in the middle. It's the only way to make an exact sequence here. And K1 the same. So what are the new generators? Well, we already had the bot element yesterday, which was written on a two-sphere, okay? But this bot element appears here. It is the pre-image of the non-trivial element with a winding number under the exponential map. So K0 of A2, of the two-dimensional rotation algebra, consists, is, gen is Z2, is generated by the dimension and by the bot element this spot 
projections that I, but that I wrote out yesterday. Okay? And then you can go on. You can understand, you can use this exact sequence to really construct all the generators. So we have a perfect understanding of all the generators in this algebra. And a good way to do that is, well, if, if the K0 and Ki groups are, uh, as I said here, Z to the power 2 to the power D minus 1, uh, a good way to label them, sorry, is to use subsets of the index, I mean index subsets of the sets of uh, 1, 2, up to D. And to each such subset, you have one generator, okay, which you can construct explicitly. It's just a way to enumerate. I don't want to give the full construction now. And uh, this generator depends only on the directions which are involved in the index set. So in dimension three, for example, on the three torus, there are non-trivial elements which only depend on one element because on the, or even let's start on the, with the two torus, it's easier. On the two torus, you, you have functions which wind around once like this and once around like this in the torus. These functions generate non-trivial unitaries and are therefore generators of elements in K1. And they are the two ones which build up Z, the, the Z2, which is K1 of A2, okay? And you see they only depend on one direction, okay? Therefore, you would say a convenient way to label them is to say I, I label them by the dimension which they depend. Okay, so this gives you all the, a, a way to label them in even and an odd degree. Uh, so, for example, what does the K-theory afterwards, once you have done that, okay, what the K-theory tells you, whenever you have any kind of a projection, you can decompose it over the generators with integer coefficients. Well, that's just the decomposition that you have in this group, okay? If K0 is the group Z to the power D to D, um, uh, Z to the power 2 to the D minus 1, well, okay, there are all these generators that I now have, I give them a name, there are these things here, and I can decompose in that group with the natural additive structure everything in that basis. That's all that we say there. Now the point is, well, we are going to see in a second, I mean, we want to do this for the Fermi projection. What is really the interesting information are the numbers up there in front. These are the invariants, okay? These are, this is the topology that is intrinsic in that uh, projection. And we want formulas to calculate because K-theory is something abstract, but I would like a nice formula to write down to calculate precisely these numbers because afterwards these numbers are going to be responsible for physical effects, okay? Okay, so this is a bit what we want to do now. Um, somehow, okay. Um, did I maybe... There we are. So let's, let's go to our physical system again. I basically told you we have a system of fermions, so there's the Fermi projection. If the family of operators is covariant, also this projection here is a covariant family, so it really defines an element in the K0 group of the algebra. Yeah? And uh, that's what's written here. And if the system has a chiral symmetry, like in this SSH model that I was discussing, then uh, the operator's off-diagonal and the off-diagonal entry here is invertible and defines me via its face a unitary, which is also covariant and therefore defines an element in the K1 group, okay? So let's try and calculate these things. Uh, or let's first make some, some comments on, on how to do that. So if we have the Fermi projection, we can decompose. If we have, that's what I told you before, if we have this invertible operator A, which is often called the Fermi unitary, you can also decompose it well over the generators of the K1 group now. And um, now, well, there's a whole lot of invariants in here. There's one invariant in each of these formulas which is called the strong and top invariant, which is the most important one that one first should look at. It's the one which depends on all spatial directions. So in two dimensions, it's a projection which intrinsically depends on the two spatial directions, so it's the bot projection for K0, okay? In 
two dimensions in K1, you don't have such an element, but in three dimensions, so for a three dimensional system, there's something which has a three dimensional winding number. And I want to talk about that thing afterwards. Uh, this three dimensional winding number is something, well, you, you can write out what the generator is. It's basically, I, I told you what it is before. You can write it out with these Clifford algebra uh, techniques. Uh, but it's, it's also, there's one interesting top generator. And then there are all these other entries, which are, for example, in the Fermi projection, there might all be these lower invariants, which are called weak invariants. The weak invariants are also responsible for physical effects, and therefore also your interest in calculating. But the first step is usually that people calculate the top invariants of the thing where you, the, the generator depends on all directions, okay? So how do we calculate that? Let's, let's not do this thing down here. Uh, how do we go about calculating that? So what I want to do now is basically transpose the formalism of differential topology to this non-commutative framework. So I'm not sure how much you have heard about differential topology, but one thing you have heard already, namely, I told you how to calculate the winding number. The winding number is something purely topological. Any continuous function has a winding number, but if the function is differentiable, you can calculate the winding number by calculating an integral. No? It was the integral over this, the circle, which is the base space on which it lives. You calculate the integral of f minus 1 df. Okay? So in two dimensions, you can calculate, if you have a two-dimensional vector bundle, you can calculate the Chern number of the bundle by writing down a certain integral over the two torus. In D dimension, there are certain D dimensional integrals which really look complicated, yeah? Which involves constructing certain differential forms which allow you to calculate these invariants, okay? Now, this is classical differential topology. Namely, you have a base space which is a manifold on which you have a differential structure and then you go on about calculating the topology, so these integer numbers in particular. Here we have a non commutative algebra but we can still do the same thing, namely on the algebra you have instead of differentiation you have commutators, so you have non-commutative derivatives and the second thing that you have, you have integration. Integration is replaced by taking a trace on the algebra. And in our algebra there are such natural tools, okay? So that's what, I, what this is about. We do non-commutative analysis on this non-commutative algebra now. So the first thing is the tracial state. We already met that one. So you see if you have a covariant family of operators in this AD, let's call it A, the operator, you take the matrix element at the origin. So this zero here is really the point at the origin in the lattice at D. And then you um, have an L by L matrix, okay? And this L by L matrix, well, I have to trace, trace it out. That's this trace here. And then I have a number. Once I got that number, it is still a random number. Why? Because it depends on all configurations. I calculate everything concretely for a given configuration. So we take an average here. This is this expectation here over the randomness. So what you suppose given is a probability distribution on all the random matrices that you put in. Okay? So once you've done that, the claim is that this operation, the whole combination here, defines a trace. So trace means what? Well, trace has the usual rules. It's trace of AB is trace of BA, for example. But now think about it. A and B, they are covariant families. If I take the product of two covariant families, I get another covariant family. So that's, first of all, an element in the algebra. And then you have to check that this rule here still holds. Okay? There's a product to be calculated, and you have to check that that's true. So the second thing that you have are derivations. So they replace derivatives, in this case, on the Bill one torus. So if you open the solid state physics books, you find lots of DKs, yeah? And um, also in, in many articles nowadays, yeah? Uh, so this is replaced by this non-commutative derivative, and we already had it the other day, commutator with the position operator, okay? Now the point is, you say, well, the position operator itself, it's not at all covariant because the, well, it's the position, think in one dimension, the position is growing like that. It's not at all covariant, is it? However, if I take the commutator of the position with 
a covariant operator. I will get a covariant operator again. Why? Because if you write the matrix elements of that guy, I do it in one dimension, say, okay? What happens is that you have here one n, and here you have an m, but because of the commutator, it's n minus m. Okay? And that n minus m is, shift, is invariant under shifts. If I shift, the, dif the distance between, I mean, the difference n minus m is not being changed because I change n and I change m. So the difference is not changed. Okay, therefore, this really, the right-hand side, really defines an operation which sends a covariant operator again to a covariant operator. But as usual, you have the same difficulties as in differential analysis. Not every operator in the C-star algebra is differentiable, okay? Why? Because you see, I want this thing here to have certain decay properties, but I multiply with something which becomes relatively large. Okay? So it's the same thing like in, in Fourier space. If you think of a function on the, on the circle, it's Fourier transform, multiply the Fourier coefficients by n. You don't necessarily get something which is, uh, again, the Fourier transform of a nice continuous function. Okay? So not all operators are differentiable. And you have to take a little bit care about that. But uh, setting aside these things, which can be done, okay, uh, these gradients do define you a differentiation in the sense that you have, for example, the Leibniz rule. That's the most important thing. The gradient of A times B is the gradient of A times B plus A times the gradient of B. Okay, that should make you feel comfortable. Okay? And moreover, the trace and the the trace and the differentiation, they work together. Namely, you have that the trace of the gradient of A is equal to zero. Like you would integrate over a closed manifold, the integral over a closed manifold of a closed form vanishes. Okay? This you know from your class and manifolds. So that's the equivalent of that because the manifold, also here the non-cumulative manifold, is closed. Okay? And it's easy to verify that. Why? Because you see here you take the zero matrix element but if, if, if this is it, there's an x in there, well, there's, there's zeros there, okay? Okay, moreover, this trace given by this formula can be rewritten as a trace per unit volume. So, uh, I'm not going to explain it in detail, but uh, roughly, what you do is you take the trace in a finite box and then you make the box bigger and bigger and you divide by the, vo divide by the volume that means you take the trace per unit volume, okay? That limit can be taken, and the Birkhoff theorem tells me that limit is exactly equal to the thing up there, provided the measure is, is ergodic, okay? Uh, yeah? Uh, this, uh, you mean that you have an exact point, right? And the integral yes. Is or is it not a close? Uh, exact, sorry, I should have said exact, yes. You're perfectly right. Okay, the integral of d omega is zero. So this value would be like the area the Yes. You can build up something like non-differential, non commutative differential forms with these gradients, okay, by taking a, um, the exterior product with the Grassmann algebra. Okay, then you're really in this framework. And it's actually useful to do that. Okay, so these are the analysis tools. Now, what are the formulas? Uh, well, okay, here maybe one slide uh, to, to uh, say how this equivalence goes. The operators, the non-commutative operators in, in uh, solid state physics would correspond to function on the Brill 1 zone inside of the matrices over the Brill 1 zone. So a typical thing called A of K. The gradient is called, it becomes the derivative with respect to quasi-momenta and the trace is the integral over the real one zone, okay? And, uh, well, therefore, if you know this little dictionary here, and you can add a little bit other few points, any kind of a formula that you find in solid state physics books can be translated in this framework, okay? Good, now, here are the topological invariants. Uh, and, uh, well, it's, a, it's an awful formula, so let's get used to, to looking at the formula and let me point out uh, the details. I mean, it's a complicated formula. It's natural because you're calculating a complicated object. object. 
We first do the case where we have an invertible specifying a K1 class element. So in dimension D equal to one, we had the non-commutative winding number in the first talk. And it was what? It was just the trace. That's basically what we took, the trace of A minus one gradient A. This was our winding number that we had. I wrote it in a little bit of a different way because I wrote the trace out and it was really this matrix element expectation and then you had here the matrix A and here I had the commutator in there, but it was this formula, okay? It's just a rewriting of that. So basically that's the formula that you have here for the, when the index set I has just one derivative, so I have just the derivative in one direction, so here's x1, so gradient in the one direction. Now suppose we're in three dimensions. Now I have three derivatives, x1, x2, x3, and uh, well, I should use all of them if I want to calculate something which is intrinsically three-dimensional. And you see this is what we do here. Here's a minus one, and then there are three different derivatives, actually, and you take the product of all of them. Well, three if the index set here has three entries. So if the index set i is one, two, three. I have there a product of three factors like this one. But, well, in which order should I take them? There are various orders that I can take them. The order should make a difference. So what one does here is that you permute, to take all kind of permutations that you can take and you weigh them with uh, the signature of the permutation. So this comes out of doing tensorizing Grassmann algebra, okay? And uh, well, then you take the trace, okay? And then you integrate. So that's the differential form here with this factor here, the sum here, and then you integrate it. In the front, there's a complica complicated numerical factor. A numerical factor is not so easy to find. And uh, uh, okay, it's important to choose the factor right because what you will find if you choose the cor correct factor, that this number is an integer. But you could also say the way to calculate that number in front is that, okay, I calculate that object and I want that it should be an integer number. So I have, have to choose the right coefficients. Well, there's a little bit more to that, okay? There's a whole theory about how to con calculate these, these indices behind it. But we understand that quite well. So this is, for example, in three-dimensional systems, this formula with three derivatives would give you a three-dimensional winding number. Well, it's not really a winding number, it's something more complicated than a winding number, yeah? But it calculates the intrinsic three-dimensional topology in our systems. So in two dimensions and even dimensions, uh, we usually use uh, the projection themselves, so a K0 class, but you can also do this here in, in, in odd dimensions, but let's look at the other case. You either want to extract something from unitaries or from projections. So let's do the projection case. The formula looks a little bit similar like the one up there, except that for the projection, of course, there's no inverse in, of any interest. So there's only projections appearing in here, but then you also have products and you have permutations about commutation, I mean, uh, commuta uh, permutations of these products standing in there. And it's, it's relatively similar, the formula. It should be set and still hmm? Uh, yeah, so the point is that the top invariant with these normalizations turns out to be an integer. But the others are not. They, are, they can be, for example, rational numbers. You could think of a, a rational number. What they are is that the image of this thing here, yeah, this map where you put in all projections from the K group, the image has to be an image of uh, Z d to the uh, z to the power 2 d minus 1. Okay, so it's a discrete subset of the real axis that you get. Uh, good, so complicated formulas, but um, actually mainly for these formulas, or the, the way to deduce these formulas, one of the Fields medals has been given. These are due to Alan Kahn, well, in a more abstract framework, but it's basically using that framework to our solid state physics systems here. And one of the things that he proved is that uh, these formulas here, they're really calculating homotopy invariance. So it's not obvious at all that if I start changing A here in a homotopic way, 
so choosing a different representative of my k1 element, that this formula spits out the same number, but it does. Okay, so doing a homotopy, we saw that uh, for the winding numbers. Doing a homotopy, the winding number of the function, you don't change the winding number, the, the integral gives you the same. Huh? This, uh, this integral here gives you the same. And that's also true for these more complicated expressions. Okay, so there are homotopy invariants. That's what's written down here. So it also for the projections, if you change the projection continuously, the value of that doesn't change. So what other things do we know? Well, maybe skip this slide here, but because you asked, this slide might be of interest. Is, um, I will show you in a second that the top invariant is an integer number with the normalizations chosen, but the lower ones are not. Namely, you have this type of formula. You can take, uh, well, let me explain the first, uh, this type of a formula in two dimensions. So in two dimensions, there's something called a straight-up formula in solid-state physics, which I'm afraid most of you don't know, but uh, okay, some might. Um, it tells you that the whole conductance is given by the derivative of the density of states. Okay, it's a fact. And uh, you can reformulate this straight-up formula in the following way. The whole conductance is given by the second churn number of the Fermi projection. Okay. You calculate it with the formula that I had on the first day there, which was, well, not generalization of this. You had the Fermi projection, and then you have two derivatives now, gradient one and gradient two. We had two projections. We take the permutation, which is taking the sum over the two permutations in the group of S, S2 now, with a different sign, therefore the commutator. You take the trace, the prefactor, which looks complicated in general, and dimension two is just two pi i, and this is the churn number, okay? And in my notation, it would be churn number associated to directions one and two. So there's also a churn number without no derivative. Well, the churn number with the empty set is just the trace. So this trace here is not at all an integer, okay? So if you think of the Landau operator that I explained, the trace of the projection would be the density of states in the first Landau. So what it does, it depends on the magnetic field. Yeah? If you make the magnetic field, you, you change it, the density of states of one Landau band, whether it be blown up by disorder or it be just a singularity, it changes. And the way it changes is that uh, it changes linearly in the magnetic field. So the fact is that if you derive this density of states by the magnetic field, then it's equal, the derivative is equal to an integer. Okay? And it, this integer is the, is the second Schoen number. So basically, this scheme here holds also for all the higher invariants. Okay? Namely, if you take uh, the churn number, for example, in dimension four, this thing here in dimension four, and you derive with respect to the magnetic field in the directions three, four, in a four-dimensional system, then it gives you the top di invariant in dimension four, okay? So, of course, this one, this, the churn number in dimension four, the two-dimensional churn number in dimension four, grows linearly with the magnetic field. It's not an integer, therefore, okay? Um, yeah, so this allows you to calculate all the image of all these, these formulas allow you to calculate the whole range that you get under the pairing of the um, K groups with uh, these cyclic co-cycles or with these formulas that I gave you there. So this is sort of like a gap labeling. If you would just look at these kind of objects, you would get a gap labeling, but in higher dimension you get a labeling by um, well, it, you get a gap labeling for the topological invariance, more complicated, but it's basically the same thing behind it. The second thing that I should think is tell to you is that if you, if you think about what you do here, it's this taking this derivative is something which is highly non-trivial because I have a, a d-dimensional system and I, which has a constant magnetic field I want to derive with respect to the magnetic field. That's a dramatic change. 
okay? So many people have started looking at deriving with respect to the magnetic field. It's dramatic if you write this in an operator language. Why? Because the magnetic field entered into the magnetic phase operators and there were factors like e to the power i xb. Now suppose you start deriving with respect to b. You get an x. It's becoming horrible, uncontrollable, okay? But in this algebraic formalism, uh, there's a nice way to do calculate these derivatives and it leads to these beautiful formulas, okay? Another thing that I should say is, well, you would say, why, well, it's crazy. Why do you think about four dimensions? <laughs> but actually, this four dimensions is very, very natural because if you have a three-dimensional physical system and you drive it periodically in time, this periodic time dri driving introduces a fourth direction, okay? And uh, this periodic time driving allows you to calculate something which is called the polarization. And then it, there's a, a second order effect, nonlinear effect, which is called the magne magnetic electro response, which is exactly connected to the four dimensional invariant, namely the derivative with respect to the magnetic field of the polarization is the magnetic electric response. Okay, and then this formula here becomes extremely interesting. Okay, it's, I didn't tell you the details what these objects are, but I mean, okay, if you really want to read about it and how to connect these topological invariants to measurable quantities, uh, let me advertise the book that I wrote there. This is written in one chapter of the physics, so to say, to, to these numbers. Okay, so... Up to now, this was the invariance. Maybe briefly, let me tell you that for the top invariant, an important thing in the, in the theory is that you can show that the top invariant is always an integer. That basically allows you to calculate the whole range. And the fact that that is an integer requires the proof of an index theorem. Okay? So here's how you go about calculating the index theorem uh, in odd dimensions, say. Okay, in odd dimensions we had this A, and the first index theorem that I told you on the first day was this Noether index theorem, which told you that the winding of a number, which is basically this thing here, up to the factor I here, this was the winding of A, this was equal to the index of a Fretholm operator, which is the Hardy projection of the operator A itself. Okay, this is what we had. Now, how do you go about that in higher dimensions? Well, in higher dimensions, what is the appropriate Hardy projection? Basically, the formula will look the same. If you look down here to the bottom, you have a d-dimensional churn number. So in dimension three, it's this three-dimensional winding number, okay? And it's equal to the index of a Fretholm operator. And all of a sudden, the Fretholm operator looks the same as here, okay? Looks the same, except that you have to know what the pi is. And... Um, well, what is, uh, what is the pi? So this is what, what's explained up here. So usually if you go about proving index theorems, there's, um, there's a Fretholm module behind it. That means there's some kind of a Dirac operator behind it. And here the Dirac operator is this animal here. There are the position operators, and they are tensorized with gamma matrices. So the gamma matrices are the usual gamma matrices in Clifford algebra, yeah? Uh, acting on an exterior Hilbert space and uh, which you just tensorize onto the physical Hilbert space. This is a physical Hilbert space. You tensorize the Clifford algebra representation space so that you can build that thing. So this is an unbounded operator. It doesn't look like a Dirac operator because usually Dirac operator is a first derivative, isn't it? But if you do a Fourier transformation, this x here in Fourier space becomes a deriv derivation with respect to the quasi-momentum. That's roughly what I told you, okay, before. So basically, this is the dual um, Dirac operator of the Dirac operator on the d-dimensional torus. Now, this operator here is a self-adjoint by construction if I choose the gamma matrices to be self-adjoint, okay? And uh, therefore, uh, I can... Wait a second, uh, let me check with the... Yeah, right. 
Um, therefore, I can look at um, basically its positive spectral projection. So I should have maybe said it in this way. What was the Hardy projection here? Was the projection onto positive frequencies. It, it can also be seen as the projection on, of this operator. If there's just one x, I use the projection on all positive, on the positive spectral subspace of x. It's the Hilbert space L2 of n, of positive sites. Okay? So here you do the same thing. You take this d, and you take the positive spectral projection of d, and you call it pi. Right? So this is just a fancy way of writing this here. Forget about that. That's the pi down here. Okay? So this is the type of index theorems that you get. And it tells you in particular that uh, the normalizations, this is non-trivial at all to prove. Yeah? It's, it's a hard proof. And it tells you that uh, the normalizations are chosen in the right way, such that this is really an integer. Okay? Remember, there was complicated factors in there. For even dimensions, well, the thing is um, similar. Uh, these churn numbers are also equal to a Fretholm index, but maybe let me skip that and rather go on to some other applications now. So, I wanted to, so what I want to tell you now, also this I wanted to skip, I want to go on far. I want to show you now how this bulk boundary correspondence really is put to work, okay? And uh, because I told you a lot about these boundary maps in, in K-theory, and now let's put it really to work on these solid state physics systems and uh, prove what I promised you that on, not on these systems on the boundaries you have non-trivial edge states. So one part of this I already told you yesterday. I mean, we, had, we now constructed this algebra of the bulk, this was the algebra of covariant operators. But now we want to construct also an algebra of operators acting on the half space. And that just means a little change, a tiny little change, namely the, I choose it in the dth direction. The dth direction becomes a partial isometry. So like in one dimension, the shift is replaced, the bilateral shift in the dth direction is replaced by the unilateral shift, okay? Looks like a very tiny difference, but it introduces a huge defect in this algebra. In particular, uh, this algebra here is also called triplets extension, like in one dimension. Uh, it has a huge kernel. The kernel consists of all operators acting on the edge, which is something, well, which is actually pretty isomorphic to a D minus one dimensional algebra. That's very natural if the operators in the Let's think of a 2D situation. In the 2D situation, could be moved around everywhere and would be the same. If I cut off this, at least they should be still covariant in this direction. Okay, I, could shove, I can shift them in this one direction and uh, obtain a new operator inside of the family of operators on a half space. And therefore, all the operators on the edge, well, they should be given by a one-dimensional lower algebra of operators, covariant operators, which is a d minus one. Well, plus a modification. The modification is that uh, there are compact operators in the perpendicular direction. Here, everything going in that direction. So this is a compact operator set. So that's, uh, of course, something big and changes a lot, but it doesn't change the K-theory because one of the things that I told you that K-theory is invariant under tensorizing of compact operates. It's compactly stable theory. So this thing here will not change the K-theory. So the K-theory of the edge is like the K-theory of one dimension lower. Okay? Good. Moreover, we have this exact sequence here. Now, uh, well, I basically only took the abstract thing that we had yesterday and, and wrote it out. But what we are going to be interested now is, is this exponential map and this index map. Why? Because it connects you, the d-dimensional k-theory, to the d-minus-one-dimensional k-theory, which is precisely the k-theory on the edge. Now, this exact sequence does that automatically, okay? I, I don't have to tell you anything on top of that. But what I told you now is that we have formulas to extract the K-theory 
from the projection, which is non-commutative differential topology, okay, these large formulas. They allow me to calculate the K-theory. The point is that uh, if you look at uh, that, that these formulas, okay, they behave well under this exponential index map here in the following way. If you take a projection up here, P, that's, that's the second formula here, and you calculate its topological content using a differential topological form, yeah, non-commutative, this um, churn number with index set I, which has to contain the dth direction then this topology can be read of, well, the image of P under the exponential map, so something which is in the K1 theory of the edge, by looking at the churn number with, an in, with the same index set without the D. So this is a D, uh, this is a, a form which is of degree one higher, okay? On the boundary, I have a form of degree one lower. Uh, the boundary is one dimension lower. Yeah. So the, this is this is the uh, formula which allows you to con I mean which allows you to control this side of the diagram and on the other side of the diagram well the same thing holds you just have the index map of an element a which specifies a k1 class you can calculate it with well a one dimensional higher form of um, um, on on the um, on the bulk algebra. So, sorry, I should have said it like this. Okay, here's the A, it's mapped up here, and there you have the lower dimensional form on the boundary. Okay, so that's not at all easy to prove. Okay, but uh, we know it's, it's true. Let's apply it. Oh. So the first application is in uh, two dimensions, and that's an application that I worked on already 10 years ago. 15 years ago, so it's, it's an old story, um, but nevertheless it's still a good story, I think. Um, in two dimensions, um, for the quantum Hall effect that I described in, in detail in the first lecture, you have a Fermi projection, which could be the projection onto one Landau band, for example, and from this Fermi projection, well, you calculate the churn number, this thing over here, the churn number one, two, this formula here, and it is equal to the whole conductance. That that's equal is not easy to prove, but it's not so complicated. It's linear response theory to do that, yeah? And it's a well-established fact again. So let's just think that that number is interesting. What does that number give me on the boundary of the system? Okay. Well, we know the general theory that I had there. It tells me that I can calculate the exponential map of P, and then I should throw away the derivative in the two direction. Okay, so I have a one-dimensional churn number of the exponential. One-dimensional churn number means that I just have a winding number. It's exactly this formula here. Okay? And I pair it with what? Well, with the exponential map of P. Good. So we need to know what this exponential map of the Fermi projection is. Yeah? So let's calculate it. How did one go about calculating the exponential map? It was e to the 2 pi i times the lift. So the exponential map of k theory of the class of p, which is in k0, was the exponential map, I mean the exponential, of a lift of p. And that is a class in k1. What is the lift? Well, the lift was something where you had P, which was in A2 here, the two-dimensional algebra, and you have to lift it into something uh, which is in the triplets extension of that, so in the half-space operators. So how do we do that? How do we get this lift, the lift of P, which projects down to P? Well, one way to do that is that you write this projection if there's a gap, okay, suppose there's a gap. So we're in this situation that there's here one Landau level and then starts the second Landau level, okay? So I have a gap here to make things easy for now. Then I can write this Fermi projection, which would be calculated with the indicator function here. 
This is the indicator function. So here's one. So P is the indicator function of the Hamiltonian on this interval. I can also modify the indicator function because here there's no spectrum to make a continuous function out of that. So let me call that function G. And it's still true that this G of H is also the Fermi projection. Now the crucial point is, is that G is continuous. Now because G is continuous, G of H is uh, inside of the C state algebra while a spectral projection inside, I mean with, with uh, which is a discontinuous function would not be in the algebra in general because the algebra, the C star algebras are only closed under continuous functional calculus. If you do measurable calculus, you get out of C star algebras. You get into von Neumann algebras which have no topology anymore, okay? So you need to do continuous functional calculus. But once we have done that, namely written this as G of H, this P, we see that we can choose the lift simply is G of H hat. What was the H hat? Well, H hat was the projection of pi, uh, the projection of H onto the half space. Well, I use the same letter pi as back there, but this is the projection on the half space, okay? We just restrict the operator on the half space. And if you calculate this object here, G of H hat, that object, yeah, is really an element in the C star algebra because H hat is and G is a continuous function, okay? And then you calculate e to the power two pi i, well, of the lift, which is G of H hat. And that's the unitary that appears there, okay? So it's this thing here, exponential of two pi i G of H hat. Let's extract the winding number of that. Well, you take that e to the power two pi i g h hat, you plug it into that formula up there, okay? You calculate. You get a winding, a way to calculate a winding number from a one-dimensional unitary operator, okay? And uh, then you do some analysis. Okay, I didn't write out the formula here, but that, that's, that's basically the fact of this. Huh? I have the winding number here standing there. The point is this winding number over here, we can recalculate it in a different way. You can write it as this. What is written down there? Well, it's the commutator of x1 with h hat. So x1 should be this direction, 1, 2. So this is the current operator in the one direction. Huh? The commutator with x, x with h is the current in the one direction multiplied by the derivative of this function g. So what's the derivative of the function g? Well, if the function g was this uh, continuous function going down slowly there, then the derivative of it is a positive or is a negative function. Well, if, if this would be g, then the derivative is something which just has a bump like that, okay? It's compactly supported there and um, it has an integral one and g hat of uh, g prime of h hat is therefore like a density matrix of states lying inside of this interval there huh? and you calculate the current flowing inside of these states because you take this density matrix of states and you calculate the current in that well, actually the current density, you see this is like a mixture of the trace per unit volume in the one direction because this current is going to flow everywhere here, but the usual trace in the two directions. So there's a sum over N2 in here, which, uh, well, one has to prove that it exists actually, but I want to calculate the current density flowing one through one line. So this is what this formula does. And the beautiful thing is that this thing on the right-hand side here, yeah, this current density flowing along the boundary is, well, equal to the two-dimensional churn number. So in particular, it is equal to an integer number. And the second thing, it's an integer number which I can predict from the topology in the bulk of the system. 
Okay? And this is very crucial for the understanding of the quantum Hall effect. Because what it tells you is that if you have a two-dimensional quantum Hall system or anomalous quantum Hall system or spin quantum Hall system, then, well, this number here is non-trivial and this non-trivial number here, integer number, dictates you how much current flows along the boundary. And the current is extremely robust. In particular, it's so robust that I can, well, for example, I can add disordered potential. I can cut out slices from the edge. If you cut a hole here, it doesn't make any difference, okay? Do something like this, well, then the current is just going to move by, but there's, there's still the same current density flowing by. Good, so this is a very old story. Now, we have set up the whole formalism so that we can do new things. And this was a proof, but okay, I want to go and explain you one new thing. Um, so let's go to three-dimensional systems and see what in three dimensions can be said about, about boundary correspondence. So in three dimensions, let's suppose we're in a situation where the system has intrinsic three-dimensional non-trivial topology. So it's a three-dimensional winding number that is present in the system. In order for that to be defined, you need the system to be chiral, okay? So that the top class in odd dimensions is a K1 element. You need this chiral symmetry. Okay, so there are many models. It's easy to write model, interesting models of that type. Uh, therefore, the Fermi projection is uh, described by a Fermi unitary, and the interesting object is this churn number of, with uh, three derivatives that you extract from the Fermi projection, so uh, from the Fermi unitary. Okay? So intrinsic three-dimensional topology and the general boundary correspondence, this theorem tells me that, okay, if I take the 3D system and I restrict it to a half space, I'm now on the left-hand side of the diagram, I take the image under the index map of A and I should calculate a two-dimensional churn number. So again, an object which looks like that, much easier. Okay. Perfect. So uh, what's the interesting situation that something like this happens with? Well, okay, I mean, uh, what, what is this index map? Again, we have to calculate the index map. Yeah? We have to calculate the index map. So here I showed you in detail how to calculate the index, not the index map, but the exponential map. Now we want to calculate the index map. So let's let me explain you how that goes. So here's the spectrum of the chiral operator. So this is our Hamiltonian, okay, 3D, three-dimensional Hamiltonian. It's chiral, so it has a spectral symmetry around zero, yeah, because the chiral symmetry maps at H into minus H. Typical situation is which, where you have here bands. Okay. So these are the, what people say, the bulk bands the three-dimensional bands, and they are not very symmetric. So maybe let's move the zero a bit to the left. And um, now we restrict the system to a half space. So half space is really a, a half, a three-dimensional half space, yeah? So what will typically happen is that uh, the restriction to the half space will create boundary states. So the spectrum of the half space operator will have spectrum in this interval. And actually what we will prove is that we must have such spectrum. Whatever spectrum you have there, it is going to be still a chiral operator, so the spectrum is symmetric. So that means that if I have a little piece of spectrum sitting here, there has to be a piece of spectrum on the other side. Okay? And if I have a band here, I have a band over there. It might also happen that the full interval is filled, but it's not necessarily. In particular, one way to create gaps like this is as follows. You take this 3D sample, and you have on the surface of these states, of these 3D samples, you have like a two-dimensional electron gas. Now, how do you create many gaps in a 2D electron gas? Well, you impose a magnetic field. So if there's a magnetic field perpendicular to that, you are like in the Harper operator that I described in the first lecture, and it has lots of gaps, okay? 
So producing gaps like this comes from a magnetic field in the uh, in the one two direction. So the one that uh, oh I, well yeah in the one two direction. Okay. This can be opened by magnetic field. Also other phenomena, but okay, just to have something concrete. Good. Now, if you're in that situation here, there's a, a central band. So the central band plays the role of the zero modes in the 1D model, actually. So there's a Fermi, uh, there's a projection that I can calculate out of that. And let me call the projection on the central bands just p hat. So the, the point is, is that the index map of A can be calculated in terms of this p hat in the following way. Uh, you can decompose this p hat into a positive and in a negative chiral sector. Okay, so the chiral symmetry was J. J acts on p plus and minus, like plus minus, okay. Like we did also with the boundary states in one dimension. Okay, but these are bands, okay? These are not just states. They're not finite dimensional. You think of them as projections on two-dimensional electron gases living on the surface, okay? So the index map is the difference between these two chiral, this tree, between these two projections, okay? It's kind of natural. But to prove it, uh, or to calculate it, well, you have to know what the index map is. I gave you a rough description of how to do that. There was this formula, and then when you use that formula, you plug things in, you do a little bit of functional calculus, and you get out that answer. Typically, typically, one of these guys here is zero. Why? Because it's completely unstable. If you think of, uh, in one dimension, we had this uh, one, in the SSH model, we had one boundary state. I told you, you can create a three-fold degenerate state, but it's very unstable because the signature of that state would be 2, 1, and two eigenvalues could move out, even, such that at the end you just have one state which has definite chirality, okay? So generically, one of these guys here will be zero. So let's suppose that we're in such a situation, okay? Suppose that either one of them is zero, you can say something also if that's not true, but this makes it somehow easier. Well, if, if one is zero, then the formula up here tells me that uh, the index map is then given, say, by P plus, that from this P plus, I can calculate a churn one, two number, which is a Hall conductance. Well, what does that mean? That means that on the surface of this 3D system, there is a quantum Hall effect, okay? So you have a two-dimensional physics, uh, two-dimensional quantum Hall effect physics on the surface of a 3D system with a uh, Hall conductance, which is imposed by the bulk topology of the system. So in particular, it does not really need magnetic fields. I argued here with the magnetic field to open the gap, but this magnetic field is not at all like the magnetic field opening the gap in the Landau model. The, the Hall effect, the quantum Hall effect on the surface is there because uh, there's topology three-dimensional topology in the solid, okay? Good, now I have uh, five, seven minutes, well. Um, I'm almost tempted to stop here, but okay, let me maybe make a last comment about these boundary states. I mean, in particular, one of the things that you can conclude from this, yeah, is if, if if this uh, number here is non-trivial, uh, to have a non-trivial quantum Hall effect on the surface, you need to have some states, okay? <laughs> they have to be there. Well, uh, they need to be there, uh, so that's in particular a proof of the existence of this non-trivial first surface physics, okay? There are these states. But moreover, these states have a property, namely, they conduct the Hall, they have Hall conductance. So they can't all be localized states. Some of these states must be delocalized, okay? So there can't be any Anderson localization there, which is a bit strange because, okay, well, a bit strange. I mean, we know from quantum Hall physics now, but I mean, for a two-dimensional electron gas, if you have no magnetic fields, it's going to localize everywhere. But this 
electron system will not do that, okay? Uh, there is always a non-trivial Hall conductance, so somewhere there must be divergence of the localization length. In, and this is basically the object of this last slide then. Um, well, in odd dimensions, uh, which is what was described just in a second ago, uh, higher than three, if this higher dimensional, highest dimensional invariant is non-trivial, then we know that there's no lo Anderson localization at the Fermi level here at mu equal to zero. Okay, can't be. Uh, that we can prove. Okay, so there must be delocalized states on the surface. In even dimension, the situation is even better. In even dimensions, it's not only at one energy, but it's all through the gap that uh, you have, that uh, you have delocalized states. So going back to the Landau operator back here, so if this is the spectrum of the Landau operator, okay, we had these Landau levels, and I said, uh, let's suppose that between these Landau levels, the density of states vanishes and there's no spectrum, so you still have spectral gaps, yeah? What the theorem there tells you is that inside of these spectral gaps, you will have surface states. The first theorem told us they curry current, but this also means that these surface states, even though it's a one-dimensional system of surface states, yeah, they don't localize. There's no Anderson localization for any of the states in this interval here. Okay? Well, the theorem reads like that. If the top invariant in any arbitrary even dimension is, is non-trivial, yeah? so you have non-trivial two or four-dimensional topology, there's no Anderson localization uh, for the boundary states. Technically, what we do is we verify that eisenmann molchanov bound cannot hold, at least. Okay? Okay. So this is roughly what we can do about these topological insulators. So I have, uh, should maybe take two minutes to say what I didn't tell you, but what is out there in the mathematics literature, uh, mathematical physics literature. I did not at all talk to you about these systems with real symmetry. So time reversal symmetry, particle hole symmetries, Majorana states, spin quantum Hall effect. There you go into the field of real K theory and uh, a lot of things can be said. In particular, we have index theorems, we have boundary correspondence, not for all situations. And then you have a whole large, large table of, of these, uh, let's see, maybe show you this, a whole large table of these invariants here, which looks like this, which people call a top, an, an periodic table of topological insulators. And uh, well, what is in this table is that you have here the dimension of physical space, and here you have the symmetry classes, so what I only talked about is this very first line here, this first, uh, first two lines here, where you either have a chiral symmetry or you don't have a chiral symmetry, and the Zs which are in here, they are the top topological invariants. So I talked to you about this thing here and about the physics and boundary correspondence associated to these numbers, the top invariants, without real symmetries, but in if you have real symmetries, well, you have uh, an 8 by 8 block here of 64 invariants, which are the top invariants of real K theory. And for all of them, we also have index theory. And then you have to go into, well, into in particular the two and three dimensional cases here and look at for one such Z2, what is the associated physics? What's interesting to be seen about? What effects has that? Okay, so we haven't. I mean, many, many people have worked on that and have understood many of these things here. On the mathematics side, we haven't worked on all of them, but even on the physics side, not all of these entries in the table here are really understood in the sense that they, people know what physical effects are low, uh, associated to that. The table itself comes relatively easy out of the K-theory, the real K-theory of d-dimensional tori, or even d-dimensional spheres, okay? So that part of the so uh, story I did not tell you at all, okay? I stayed within the complex theory. So maybe that's a good point to stop. Thank you. Comments, questions? Do you have a reference about topological invariants? Well, okay, depending on what you want. You want the physics literature or you want the... 
li physics literature. So there's a beautiful review. Uh, so I suggest you download that because uh, the this is on my webpage. And at the end, I have a whole bunch of uh, references. And I think still a very good read is this new journal of physics paper where this K theory is beautifully described, okay? It's one of the earlier papers of the people which started the field, okay? Andreas Ludwig, Shinsei Ryu, uh, and it's very good. If you want more mathematics, I already told you there's the, the book that I wrote last year, and you can also download it. It's free online on the archives. You can click on it, okay? Well, for us that was like uh, the if the Green's function has okay. So what we prove is we we have we can't have very f uh, slow decay of the Green's function. For me, if you have a slow decay of the Green's function, there's some conduction in the system. But okay, I mean, right. I, do you have some other examples in mind where, where this is contradicted or? No, I just don't know. Maybe Fritz has a comment on that. Yeah, can I pile on? Uh, yeah. Do you know the nature of the spectrum in this interval? No. Okay. Uh, well, that's not completely true. I mean, uh, I mean, we definitely don't know anything in the chiral thing. What I do suspect is that in typical disordered situation, there will really be just one energy where your localization length diverges and you have point spectrum all the way outside, similar to a Landau level. Okay. But for the two even dimensional situ systems, it's different. Okay. There we really prove that there's no Anderson localization for all energies of, uh, in the surface spectrum. Yeah. And uh, we haven't proved AC spectrum there. But I, uh, that's not true now. I start recollecting little by little. I mean, Jörg Fröhlich uh, with Jean-Michel Le Graf and, um, and Walcher, they have uh, employed um, more estimate techniques to prove AC nature of the spectrum in certain particular situations, OK? Um, the Moore estimate, which is very natural, is, is the current operator. You look at the current operator as the positive operator because these states have to be chiral, okay? So they have a orientation. So that's a positive operator that you can work with there, okay? That's what they did. But what I think is actually, so my point of view is, is that these results are much more strong because I really don't uh, give uh, something, yeah, about what the nature of the spectrum is. Why? What this tells you, the formula that I wrote you is that I can calculate the current that this states carry. And the current is quantized. You have really quantized edge currents. And this is a physical consequence which is much stronger. Okay? So you can say there's a number of edge channels in the systems which physically are difficult to pin down. But I mean, they flow everywhere, yeah? all the way out, away from the boundary. But there's still something. If you integrate everything out, the current flowing there is, is integer. Sure. He said, speaking about the bulk uh, uh, boundary correspondence, could you say some words about the historical development? development? I mean, what is known for physicists? So I think, uh, well, I think the first person to <laughs> nail that down in the quantum Hall effect was uh, Halperin uh, in 82, in, well, in the physics paper, where he roughly says what I told you before is that the spectrum of an operator of a Landau operator on a band uh, on, on a band it should bend outside the Landau bands should bend okay so roughly this is an understanding of quantum boundary correspondence then there was a very influential paper in 93 by a guy called Hatsugai who had a very complicated proof of boundary correspondence for the Harper model so for a periodic model okay and uh, then, well, starting in the late 90s, we started working on this together with Johannes Kellendong and uh, some other people. But the newer stuff, everything in higher dimensions in particular here, is recent work with Emil Prodan, described in the book. More comments or questions? 
not less thick, very big Herman for his nice and interesting course. Uh, let me say that uh, Herman is spending a sabbatical uh, uh,